happy October. I want to say a very special happy birthday to my daughter, Flynn. Today is her birthday. Happy birthday, Flynnie. And some of you who've been here a while, you saw Flynn grow up in this community. Today, she is 26 years old. Happy birthday, Flynn. Ah. So, I want to begin by reading an excerpt from a brand new book called Ordinary Mysticism. And I'm just realizing we do not have a copy here. Carolyn, can you grab a copy of Ordinary Mysticism? I want to show everyone uh, just when you have a moment. Thank you, love. So, you, this will all make sense in a minute. So I'm going to just read a, a, a piece from this exquisite book of hers called Ordinary Mysticism, Your Life as Sacred Ground. The spiritual teacher Mirabai Star writes, Welcome to the temple of your regular life, the garden of your days, the harbor where you catch your breath, the theater of your relationships. This is the terrain where you wake up and transform. The sometimes chaotic, frequently fraught, unexpectedly beautiful domain of the everyday, your life is holy ground, and you are a mystic. She writes, I know you are a mystic because all it means to be a mystic is to have a direct experience of the sacred. You've had a zillion of those. She goes on, mysticism is a way of seeing beyond the turmoil, the rights and wrongs, the good guys and villains to the radiant heart of things. It glimpses the face of the holy in the withered dahlias. Oh, you are fast, woman. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear it for Carolyn. This is the book, Ordinary Mysticism. I'm just going to go back a bit. Mysticism is a way of seeing beyond turmoil the rights and wrongs, the good guys and villains, the radiant heart of things. It glimpses the face of the holy in the withered dahlias and blesses the sound of the siren in the middle of the night. She continues, when you decide to walk the path of the mystic, the mundane shows up as miraculous, the boring becomes fascinating and your own shortcomings turn out to be your greatest gifts. This is from the book that we are going to be using this month for the month of October. Um, we do a book series once in a while. Um, know that I have to really love a book to commit for a whole month um, to talk about it. And this is chock full of so much wisdom it is by the beloved, wise, and funny spiritual teacher Mirabai Star. Some of you will remember that a few years ago we, uh, we did a series on her last wonderful book called Wild Mercy. One of her dearest friends, just to give you a sense of things, is the writer Anne Lamott. If you are familiar with Anne Lamott's work, they both share this very practical sort of down-to-earth-ness uh, about faith and spirituality. It's so relatable. This book is available, if, for those of you here in, in person, right downstairs in our bookstore. We have some in stock. You can, you can take it with you today if you like, or certainly order it online. Mirabai's work is incredibly aligned with our New Thought teaching in a way that just is so beautiful. She is also a scholar of <clears throat> the world religions and interfaith work, and so her writing is an incredible fit for our particular community. And one of the things that I love about this book is that at the end of each chapter, she has a practice that you can engage in, as well as a writing prompt. And they're some of the best writing prompts I've ever seen. Um, and all of this supports uh, the understanding that the walk of being an ordinary mystic is something that we can actually practice. Yes, we can. We absolutely can. Now, this idea, it's an ancient idea of mysticism, is often misunderstood. You know, it's seen as either something that is like religiously elitist, you know, um, and hard for the mere mortals uh, to grasp. It's reserved for the godly few. Or this idea of being a mystic 
is thought of to be this sort of airy fairy magical mystery tour of um, you know like new agey concepts. Neither of those are true. Neither of those are true. So when I talk or when I teach about this idea of mysticism, I like to use an idea that I I sort of um, came up with. Um, many years ago, because I think it helps to really put it in context. For, for folks who are on a spiritual journey, a faith journey, there are two, really two distinct ways of experiencing God. So the first, um, imagine, if you will, a big circle. This big circle is up in the sky, and this big circle up in the sky represents God, usually with a very impressive beard. And then picture below it, much, much further away below it, is a little circle, a little circle. And this tiny little circle, in that circle, are us humans. You, me, way down here. God's up there. We're way down here. The big circle above us represents God, who is really an anthropomorphized or human-like male and who is very much outside of us humans. Now, let me be clear here, and this is really important. For many people over many centuries, this metaphor was actually very comforting, and still is for many people on our planet. For them, the majesty of the big God is deeply revered and respected. We see this in the three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. This is the monotheistic model, right? God is up there, we are down here. I speak from experience as a former Catholic. And while there are some Christian traditions that beautifully talk about cultivating a personal relationship with God, if you will. I believe at times this can be a bit challenging because it's a long distance relationship. (laughs) You know? And so that can be a little tricky. Now, in the second model, You have the same big circle that represents God. However, in this circle, God is not a man. Rather, God is a loving presence. God is the quantum field of energy, the great comforter and the indwelling presence and the essence of all of life. And the difference here is that the little circle that represents you and me and all the humans and the living life stuff is actually smack dab in the middle of the big circle. And this big, inclusive, loving circle is all of life. It's all of life and it is taken from the far away sky here to our lived reality. It is understood that God, divine, source, whatever word you're comfortable with, is in the circle of life with us, supporting us, loving us, as well as in the mystery and the things about this life that we do not yet understand. The big God becomes our lived experience of walking life and co-creating with the divine. Now, in this second model, one of the things that, that occurs is that women, girls, non-binary folk, for example, can identify with the divine. Do you see? because it's not defined as a man. Hello, 52 plus percent of the population. Isn't that a beautiful thing? As opposed to, I mean, I just know for me as a child, I could easily identify with Mother Mary, who I love, by the way. I could identify with the female saints who I love, by the way. 
But when you bring that big God in the sky, in that circle down, and we are invited in, women, girls, non-binary folks are able to identify with God as a whole. Do you see? It's actually an incredibly inclusive and beautiful way of understanding God. And in this model, there is no fear of an out there sometimes angry deity because our model of God is accessible to all of us. Right here. Accessible. Whatever your... um, perhaps religion of origin may be, you're invited into this glorious circle of life. Therefore, unlike in the first model, there are no plagues or punishments or lakes of fire or hell or guilt or damnation coming down on you from high. It's safe to be in relationship with divine, with, the, with God, with spirit. In this model, again, we co-create our life. We are not at the mercy of a man God. Rather, we are in profound oneness with it. So the second model is the model of many Eastern traditions. And it's also the model of the mystical aspects of the three Abrahamic faiths that I just mentioned. So the Kabbalah is the mystical aspect of Judaism. Mystical Christianity is, uh, or the original teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, also the Gnostic, the Gnostics, is in the second model. And the Sufi tradition, you've heard of Sufis, the beautiful Sufi tradition. We quote a lot from Rumi and Hafiz here. The mystical version of Islam is Sufism, and that lives here in this second model as well. Mysticism in its most whittled down definition can be explained as the direct experience of the divine. That's all. That's all it is. The direct experience of the divine. And as Mirabai wrote, you have experienced that a zillion times. We're going to get to that in a moment. Because I know that this idea of, you know, mysticism or being an ordinary mystic, ooh, it sounds, you know, just so sort of fancy and fantastical. But really, truly, my friends, the path of a mystic is one of recognizing, knowing, feeling, and most importantly, experiencing God or spirit in all things great and small. And that, my friends is one of the main tenets of new thought. In in our teaching, we understand that we have a non-dualistic experience of the divine. We have a lived experience of God. And in that, we get to truly experience oneness with all of life and each other. St. Teresa of Avila who lived in the 1500s, wrote about mystical theology in her book, The Interior Castle. Some of you may remember the class I taught on mysticism a couple of years ago based on her book. In it, St. Teresa specifically speaks about an interior relationship with God. Now, this was back in the 1500s. Talk about a mystic. She believed that mysticism did not mean for you to retire from life, but rather to live what she called the unitive life. One of my favorite quotes, favorite quotes of St. Teresa of Avila is, God lives also among the pots and pans. God lives also among the pots and pans. A mystic is someone who lives in this world and knows that despite the chaos, pain, or challenge spirit, God is right here to be experienced, to be felt. Mystics are human, everyday people involved in the everyday demands of life. So to be an ordinary mystic, our relationship with the divine is an interior one. There is nothing long distance about it. It is right here. And this is our practical teaching of spirituality, of progressive spirituality. 
In the Gospel of Thomas from the Nag Hammadi, which is considered to be a mystical text, Jesus of Nazareth, of Nazareth says, Split the wood, I am there. Lift up the stone, and you will find me there. Split the, a piece of wood, I am there. Lift up the stone, and you will find me there. So you can take this idea and apply it to anything and anyone. See a baby smile, I am there. Smell the earth after a good rain, I am there. Grounds cleanup work party yesterday here, I am there. Thank you again for that. Apologize for an error you made, I am there. Cause an error, I am there. Mirabai Star writes, I think you get it. You don't have to enter a monastery to be a mystic. You don't have to renounce chocolate or forsake pop culture. It is not necessary to take formal vows and beat yourself up when you inevitably fall and fail to uphold them. To be a mystic in our times, it's not about renunciation. It is about intention. She continues, the universe responds to your willingness to behold the holy by revealing that almost everything is holy. A plate of rice and beans, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, your new baby, the latest political scoundrel, the restless nights. You can start right here, she writes, in the middle of your messy life your beautiful, imperfect, perfect life. Set your intention to uncover the jewels buried in the heart of what already is. Choose to see the face of God in the face of the bus driver and the moody teenager. In peeling a tangerine or feeding the cat, decide, mean it, open your heart, and then do everything you can to keep it open. Light every candle in the room. Yeah. In her beautiful book, Mirabai gives one of the best examples of the profound healing that comes when we decide to consciously live this way. So in 1614, a boy by the name of Nicholas Herman was born into a poor family. He decided as a teenager, because he had no prospects, that he would join the military and he would fight in a war. And he was hoping that this would give him some sense of purpose in life and some money. And he endured in that war and possibly perpetrated horrors. He never was able to speak about it, never in his life. He was wounded in battle, and it left him with a very painful limp. And he was left with what we call today a very severe case of PTSD. In an attempt to heal his troubled heart, he joined a monastery with the hope that a life of prayer might alleviate his suffering. And there he took the name of Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence spent a decade from his mid-20s to his mid-30s on the edge of suicidal despair. What kept him alive, though, was something that he spoke about quite often. And it was a memory of a leafless tree that he saw one winter. And there was something about him seeing this leafless tree. And he knew, he was reminded that even though what he saw was bare branches, it would soon again blossom and it would eventually bear fruit. And this image was the sole thing that gave Brother Lawrence hope during his decade-long experience with deep despair. When things were difficult and almost everything was difficult for him at that time, he thought about that leafless tree it was his lifeline, and he was able to hold on and trust that at some point in his life, he too would have a season of renewal and blossoming, that it would arrive for him. 
Brother Lawrence developed severe anxiety and depression over this decade. And it was in the monastery that he instinctively began turning to love, to God, to spirit, in the midst of his everyday life, and centering himself there. So while in the monastery, one day, Brother Lawrence was assigned to the kitchen, which was awful because he hated cooking. He hated it. It was like, you know the thing you hate, <laughs> whatever that is, to do whatever chore that is? His was cooking, and he absolutely hated it, and that's what he was assigned to. Oh, Brother Lawrence, come on. Let's, can he catch a break? Yes, yes. He did not like chopping the onions, and he did not like washing the big, huge pots, and he had to spend hours on his feet, which caused him physical pain due to his illness. But when he was in the kitchen, he realized that the only way he could deal with all of that was to turn to love, to turn to God, to spirit even more. So he decided that he was going to think about God as he stirred the sauces and he was going to speak to God as he directed the kitchen staff. And he was going to thank God as he served the bowls of onion soup to the staff and to the other brothers. And the thing about this story that has always moved me personally is that Brother Lawrence wrote about this very human experience being really hard for him at first. He was clearly very traumatized by his experiences during the war, that decade in his mid-20s and mid-30s. That's a huge time in your life. And the thing is, he was known for actually being really grumpy. Like really grumpy. Difficult, grumpy, mopey. Life was not easy for him at all. And he kind of made life difficult for the people around him. Often his trauma would take over and he would get activated and he would spiral down. But over time, over time, the image of the leafless tree supported him. And the more that he cultivated the, the simple awareness of seeing love in the smallest and simplest of things, he found it was easier for him to slip into the divine presence. And something extraordinary happened. Over time, people around him began to notice that he actually became softer. He became kinder. He became more at peace. He became compassionate. And he became known for all of these things. He became known as someone that people could go to when they needed comfort. This practice of seeing God in all things allowed him the space within himself to listen deeply to the pain of others. Just being in his presence was healing for people. Brother Lawrence developed what is now known as the spiritual practice of recognizing the divine presence in all things, especially the small and the mundane. And this is exactly what Mirabai Starr is talking about in her beautiful book, Ordinary Mysticism. We talk a lot around here about seeing the face of God, even when it's difficult and doing our inner work so that we can, as the Buddha taught, stay awake in this life and conscious. Just like Brother Lawrence realized that it is the most normal thing and healing thing to seek out and recognize spirit of the divine in the simple moments as we go about our normal daily lives, he taught that we too can do this. You know, there's so much going on right now in our country with the storms and the hurricane. Have you seen this, the heroic efforts from the first responders? And we have a beautiful member of our own community, Matthew Lambright, who flew out to help and support in Florida. What a blessing. So there's, there's this opportunity where, where we see God in the big stuff, right? You know, World Kitchen, in the Middle East, we see God in, in, in the helpers, as, as, as Mr. Rogers taught. But we also 
can expand into it even more and we can see God, we can see the divine in the smallest things. People always say to me, why is it that everyone becomes like good to each other when these big disasters happen, right? I think that's our natural impulse as sisters, brothers, and siblings of each other. I think there's something about those big uh, disasters, the scary things that remind us that we're all members of this one human family. But we can take it to the next level, not the next biggest level. We can take it to the daily level of truly seeing God or spirit or source in the smallest things too. We can act on that too. Brother Lawrence wrote, there is not in the world a kind of life more sweet and delightful than that of a continual conversation with God. There is not in the world a kind of life more sweet and delightful than that of a continual conversation with God. That practice, my friends, is the way of the mystic. And that is our invitation to see life our life so consciously that we recognize, we recognize it to be a loving, constant conversation with the divine. So this week, I invite you to remember that you, my love, are inside God's big circle. You're inside it right now in your life. The second thing is to give yourself permission to feel God or divine love in the simplest moments. That first cup of coffee or tea as the sun is streaming through the morning window. When you get your mail out of the mailbox, I invite you to recognize everything it took to get that mail delivered to your home. All of the hands that worked to do that on your behalf. I invite you to, to feel God or the divine tonight as your head hits the pillow before you go into your dream life to recognize that that too is God, to feel and sense these spiritual, beautiful opportunities of experiencing the divine in the simplest moments. And finally, I invite you to choose if you, if you wish to do a little bit of journaling. That's one of the spiritual practices that we have here. And it's so powerful. You could even do 10 minutes, you know, or you could speak it into your phone if that's more comfortable for you. The following is a delightful writing prompt from the book Ordinary Mysticism. And we're going to go ahead and put this on our landing page of our website, so it'll be up there as well. But that is, I find the presence of the sacred hidden in. That's your writing prompt for this week. You can take a picture of it if you want, or it'll be on our website. Jot it down. I find the presence of the sacred hidden in. And just, just allow yourself to, to write freely. It will elevate your experience of God, of source, of spirit, I promise. So let this deepening experience of the divine in your everyday life be a healing balm for your soul this week. I think we can all use that right now.